Well, of all of the, uh, of all of the, the practices and things that, uh, that are important in, in the Christian life, prayer is probably, uh, if not the most important, it's one of the most important things that we do. It's, it's the way that we communicate with God. It's, it's how we cultivate our relationship with Him. Uh, it, we, it offers us comfort when we, we're in times of trouble, uh, direction when we're lost, uh, and, and strength when we're weak. But if all of us, if we're honest, we know that it doesn't always work that way. Uh, what happens when prayer seems to fail? When you cry out to God with all your heart, and yet the answer that you desperately need does not come. Now, I want to I put something out there to begin with that... Uh, that I, I know that all of us have been there at some point. Some of us are there right now in our lives. We cry out to God. We believe that He's listening, but it just feels like our prayers are bouncing off the ceiling, and we start to wonder, why did God not answer my prayer? Or you get an answer, but it's not the one that you were hoping or felt you should get. It's important to understand, and I hope this gives a little bit of a, a level of comfort here as we dive into this, that uh, God hears every prayer, every single one. God answers every prayer, but He doesn't always respond in the way that we would like Him to. Why not? Well, that's what we're going to dig into and dive into this morning, and my hope is, and, and I know of, of all of the questions that we're dealing with in this series, this is probably the hardest one to give a good definitive answer for everybody. Because prayer is, I mean, how many of you have ever seen Bruce Almighty? You know the story of Bruce Almighty. Uh, Jim Carrey plays a news anchor who things are not going the way that he thinks he's, he's praying to God. Things aren't going the way that he thinks they should. So he cries out to God and he meets God in the form of, fittingly, Morgan Freeman. And uh, in order to teach him a lesson, Morgan Freeman gives him, you know, his, his power for a short time. And there's a scene where Bruce is sitting at a computer, and all of these prayers are just flooding in, and he can't keep up with it, and so he just answers yes to everything. That's not, you know, prayer, prayer is not kind of this bulk email that, that God just receives, and then he's got it all automated. I mean, he deals one-on-one, -on -one, every single one of our prayers he addresses, he hears. And so prayer is not like this mass thing. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible for me to wrap my mind around how I can't, my, I can't even keep my kids' names straight when one of them is talking to me, let alone three of them, let al or three billion of them. I just can't fathom how God does that, but He does. And so that's one of the things that makes prayer a little bit difficult. And, and, give, and the answers to why prayer works in this instance doesn't necessarily work the same way over here. But I hope that by the time we get to the end of this, we will have a clear picture of at least how prayer works and maybe some of the reasons why it doesn't feel like God's answering our prayer or maybe the reason He answered it differently than we were anticipating. But I want to start with a foundational verse that, that on, on the one hand has been a great encouragement in, in building our trust and bringing our prayers to God, but has also been the source of a lot of the confusion surrounding prayer. In John 14, Jesus makes this bold statement. He says, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Well, that's a, that's a pretty incredible promise, isn't it? But we all know that there must be something else going on here because it's not always that straightforward. I mean, I, I, we've all prayed in this way, and we've made 100% sure that we end our prayer with those magic words, in Jesus' name, and we've even gritted our teeth and we've closed our eyes so that God knows we mean it, and yet our prayer didn't go the way that we thought it would. So obviously there's something else going on here. There's, there's, it, it, there, there's some things that, that Jesus 
is not saying in here that he's saying. So why didn't it work the way that it appears that Jesus is, it says it's supposed to? Well, we're going to look at a few reasons this morning. And a few of these are going to probably relate more to, to instances as to why it doesn't feel like God is answering our prayer, or maybe the, the prayer is delayed. One of them may be more specifically to why we got an answer that didn't quite fit into our expectations. But the first of these is that maybe the reason you're not getting an answer to your prayer, or maybe God answered your prayer in a way that you weren't anticipating, is maybe you have a broken relationship. This is, this is a, a reason that, that Jesus deals with specifically and pinpoints in the gospel as, as one of the reasons that it, one of the barriers in our relationship with God. Is there a broken relationship in your life? Now, I, this might not be what we want to hear, but Scripture is pretty clear that our relationships with other people directly affect our relationship with God and vice versa. Jesus says in Mark 11, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Well, that sounds a lot like what he said in John. It sounds really good, doesn't it? And then he has to add this on here. And when you are stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. You knew there had to be a catch, right? It's, it's interesting that Jesus ties forgiveness, both forgiveness of other people And our forgiveness between us and God, he ties that directly to our prayers. Jesus is saying, look, if you're holding on to bitterness or unforgiveness, that's a problem. It's going to create a barrier between you and God. Now, I know forgiveness, especially between people, is messy. It's it's painful at times, but the truth is... When we hold on to grudges, it affects our relationship with God and ultimately our own well-being. Say, holding a grudge is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. But Jesus even takes it a step further. In Matthew 5, He says this, If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So it, it, you can see there's this, it goes both ways. If we have something that we need to forgive a brother or sister for and we're holding on to that, then we need to deal with that before we bring our prayer to God. If our brother or sister has something against us that we need to go ask forgiveness for, we should leave our prayer <laughs> right where it is and go be reconciled to our brother or sister. You know, he... This specific situation that Jesus is talking about, this bringing your offering to the altar, uh, that was a form of prayer in the temple, uh, maybe for forgiveness or a prayer of thanksgiving. And Jesus is saying that before we approach God in prayer, we need to check our hearts and ask, am I holding on to, to any bitterness or unresolved conflict? Is some, do I, am I aware of something that somebody is holding against me? Because if, we're, if that's happening, it's going to affect our prayers. And I believe that the reason that Jesus points his finger at that, and he puts his finger specifically on that, is that he's really more concerned with the condition of our hearts than what we're going to ask him for. And then there's 1 Peter 3, 7, which is specifically addressed to husbands, but it can apply in all sorts of relationships. Peter writes this, Husbands, in the same way, be, consi- be considerate. I take my, I got to take my glasses off to read. Isn't that sad? <laughs> Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, there are pragmatic reasons for being considerate and living at peace with your wife. Husbands, you know those things. Happy wife, happy life. Right? That's what they say. But there are also spiritual implications to living in a way that honors your, your spouse. Now, I, this is a, there's a direct connection here between how we treat others, specifically our spouses, and the effectiveness of our prayers. Because that's the thing that Peter specifically points out here. Be considerate. Um, treat them with respect so that nothing will hinder your prayers. If there's a lack of respect or love or consideration in our relationships, it's going to hinder 
our communication with God. Jesus even gives us a clue of, to this in, in the prayer that He teaches His disciples. He connects our receiving and giving of forgiveness with others, our sins, with our relationship and our prayer to God. Um, we are to pray for forgiveness even as we pray to forgive those who have wronged us. So this, this act of forgiveness, both receiving and giving, plays a central role in the economy of prayer. So maybe the reason that your prayer it doesn't feel like God is answering your prayer or He's delaying, is there something else in your life that needs to be dealt with first? That there's a relationship that's broken that needs some healing. Is there someone in your life you need to forgive? Is there somebody that you need to seek forgiveness from? Is there, and this, this especially applies between, in the most important relationship we have between us and God. Is there unconfessed sin that we have not brought to God that is standing as a barrier? Don't let those unresolved issues stand between you and your connection with God. Let's look at another possibility. Maybe you have the wrong motives. Now, this one can be a little bit uncomfortable because it, it really causes us to, to do some introspection and look inward. Of why, why are you praying for what you're praying for? Is it really for God's glory or is it for your own agenda? James 4, he, James puts it pretty bluntly here. He says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Well, yeah, that's why I ask for things. I want this, yeah. That's kind of an ouch there. This verse really challenges us to examine the why behind our prayers. What, what are we really asking for, and why, are, why do we want it? Because sometimes, most of the time, I don't know that many of us pray for things that are bad. I hope not. But most of the time when we're praying for things, we're praying for something that is on the surface It's good. We're praying for health. We're praying for success. But not because we want to glorify God or not because we want His kingdom to, to be built just for our own comfort and for our own pleasure. What this really boils down to is the difference between kingdom-focused prayers and self-focused prayers. The Bible gives us all sorts of examples of selfish prayers where people's requests were driven by personal ambition rather than a desire to glorify God. That was one of the harshest criticisms that Jesus had of the Pharisees. When they prayed, they weren't praying to connect with God. They were praying to show how religious they were. They were showing off in their prayers. And Jesus condemned that attitude and He said, you know what? They wanted applause. They wanted attention. They got what they, they, got what they were asking for. Their, but their prayers were answered. Their prayers were about promoting themselves, not, not about seeking God's kingdom. You contrast that with Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not what I want, not as I will, but what you will. Even in his moment of, of where Jesus was, he was it, well within his rights to cry out to God for comfort and deliverance, he set aside his own will because he knew this was, this was what had to happen. I, uh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of Hannah. Hannah cried out to God. She pleaded with God for a child. But it wasn't, for, it wasn't because without a child, she was a social outcast. In fact, some of the other women ridiculed her because she didn't have a child. You know why she wanted a child? She wanted to turn around and give that child right back to God. And you know what happened? God answered her prayer. And along came Samuel. We need to check our motives when we come to God with our prayers. When our prayers are rooted in a desire to glorify God and advance His kingdom, they have energy, they have force, they are powerful. God hears and answers those prayers that move in the direction of His will. Our task in, our, in prayer is not to try to convince God to do what we want. Not to try to bend His will to our desires, but to align our desires 
with His purposes. When our hearts are tuned to His will, we can pray with confidence, knowing that He will answer in a way that is best for us, that brings Him glory, and that is best for His kingdom. So take a moment and just reflect on your own prayer life. What are you asking God for and why? Why is it that you want that thing that you are so desperate for? That doesn't make your request bad at all. But it is, it's important to check the reason why we're asking for that. Are your prayers centered on your own desires or are they focused on bringing glory to God and advancing His kingdom? If there's a question about that, ask the Holy Spirit to purify your motives and to help you to pray in alignment with God's will. When we, Jesus said, when we seek first His kingdom, all of these other things that we need, He'll take care of. God cares deeply about the condition of our hearts. He's not a genie who grants every wish that we, we, we give Him. He's a loving Father who's more concerned with our character than our comfort. That doesn't mean that God's not concerned with our comfort but he's more concerned with the type of people that we are. So the next time you feel like God isn't answering your prayer, take a moment and look at your motives. Are you praying for his will to be done, or are you praying for your will to be done? The next reason why God might not answer your prayer is one that we think we've all struggled with at one point or another. Maybe you don't believe God will do it. Now, I want to unpack this for a second because I want you to hear and understand what what I'm saying here. Um, I'm not talking about uh, some kind of magic formula where if you just believe hard enough, you can make it happen. Uh, Faith is not about wishful thinking. It's, It's not a magic formula. But Jesus does make it very clear that there is a, there's a, a deep connection and a close connection between faith and seeing God move in our lives. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the story of the father who brought his son, his demon-possessed son in Mark, to, to Jesus to, to be delivered. And he says, if you can do anything, have pity on us. And Jesus says, if you can, man, everything is possible to one who believes. And then the father immediately says, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I I love the honesty of the father in that moment. He has this mixture of faith and doubt. His, His doubt is not, his prayer, his plea to Jesus is not a cynical one. I mean, it's a very hopeful cry. It's not one of those things where he's, he's coming to Jesus and says, well, if you think you can help, I guess, I was thinking of Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, that figures. It's not an Eeyore prayer. He's really coming to Jesus with hope that he can do something, but boy, because of everything else that's happened, he's struggling. He believed, but he also struggled with the reality of the situation, which I think every single one of us has found ourselves in a position like that. And the incredible thing about it is that Jesus doesn't condemn him at all for that. In fact, he heals the man's son in response to his imperfect faith, which speaks directly to the tension that many of us experience when we pray, especially when we're praying for situations that we just we, in our own natural mind, we cannot fathom a resolution to. We want to believe, but doubt is, it's right there. We know that God can do anything, but sometimes we don't believe that He will. And yet Jesus assures us in His statement to this man, everything is possible for one who believes. Now, notice he doesn't say that everything is guaranteed for one who believes. Everything is possible for one who believes. And throughout the the Gospels, we see this pattern over and over again. Jesus responds to faith, whether it's the woman who seeks him out in the crowd and touches his robe, 
who's healed, or the blind men who have their sight restored, or the woman whose faith, uh, whose faith saves her time and time again, Jesus says, he, he puts the finger on it, he says, your faith has healed you. Your faith has saved you. Faith is essential. Uh, we didn't sing it this morning. I don't even know if it's in the hymnal. There's an old, old song that says, prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. We can pray, but if we don't have faith at all that what we're asking for is even possible, we're really just, we're, we're mouthing empty words to God. It's not that we don't struggle in our prayer. We do believe, but we need a little help along the way. And I think every single one of us can relate to that. It's not about having perfect, unshakable faith, though. It's about the one who we are putting our faith in. I, we have people all the time that will say to me, oh, you made it through that because of your faith. Well, I understand that. But I could have faith in everything, anything. I could have faith that if I start flapping my arms, I'm going to take off. That's not going to happen. I'm going to look like an idiot. It's not about my faith. It's about the one who I've chosen to sink my faith into. It's about trusting God even when I'm wrestling with doubt and all of these things. It's about believing that He can and will move even though I can't quite put together or understand how or when He's going to do it. The beautiful thing about this Father's response in Mark 9 is that He is completely transparent. He, in fact, He just he confesses it. I do believe, but you're going to have to take care of this part of me that doesn't. And the other beautiful part about it is that that didn't disqualify him. It didn't disqualify him from receiving his answer and the, and the miracle. Instead, it became the starting point. It was the key. It was, had he not sought Jesus out, he could have, nothing would have happened. It was faith that brought him to Jesus, but it could only bring him so far. Jesus had to do the rest of the work. And that, again, reminds us of an important lesson when we looked at this story a couple weeks ago, that, that God's not looking for perfect faith. He's looking for honest faith. He invites us to bring our doubts, our fears, our uncertainties to Him and ask Him to help us in overcoming them. If you find yourself struggling with doubt, don't be discouraged. If you find yourself in a place where your faith can bring you to it, don't, don't pull away from that. Don't shy. I encourage you, press harder into that. It's in those moments, I think, that, that God does the most shaping of our lives because when He answers those prayers, we know for sure that it wasn't anything that had to do with us because I, I, I couldn't even fully believe that God could do this. Don't shy away from them. Bring those doubts to Him, just like the Father does in Mark 9. Ask Him to overcome, help you overcome your belief. Trust that God is big enough to handle your doubts and that He will strengthen your faith as you continue to seek Him. Talk, again, talked about it. Faith is like a muscle. you got to work it for it to grow and get stronger. The more you step out in faith, the more you trust God, the more your faith is going to grow. So even if your faith feels small, don't become cynical in that. Hold on to that, but put it in the place where it's supposed to be, in Christ. And finally, and this one probably has to, this reason probably has to do more with dealing with the, the situations where we got an answer that we weren't expecting or not the one that we were praying for. Maybe God has something different. Maybe God has something different in mind. I think this is one of the most difficult realities that we face in prayer is that sometimes God's answer is not what we expect. We might pray earnestly for something good, the healing of a loved one, relief from our own suffering, something along those lines, and yet the answer seems like it's no or not yet. And the ironic part about that is no sometimes is the easier answer because at least it's definitive. Not yet is, you know, I just think of my kids. Can we do this? In a little bit. 30 seconds later. Can we do it now? 
that not yet is, it's, man, we can all relate to that. Are we there yet? Not yet. When are we going to be there? I think in these moments, we need to be reminded of what Isaiah said, that God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. That's not an easy thing to swallow sometimes. But the reality is sometimes God's will for our lives does not align with what we want. But in those moments, we have to choose to trust that He's the wise one, He's the good one, and that His plan is always good for our good and for His glory. The reality is God is not obligated to give us everything we ask Him for. That would be wonderful if He was. Sometimes what we think is best for us is not in line with what His greater plan is. Prayer is not, again, it's not about getting God to do what we want Him to do. It's about many times aligning our desires with His will. And when our prayers align with His will, we can be confident that He will answer those prayers in the way that is best. I mean, think about it. Think about the times in your life where you may have had something that you asked God for repeatedly, and you didn't get it, and in the moment, you were upset about that, and then looking back, you're like, man, I'm glad glad God didn't give me that. I have all sorts of those prayers that I'm glad that God did not answer in the way that I asked Him to. Maybe you prayed for a relationship to work out only to realize that later it wasn't the right one. That's a key one for me right there. Or maybe you prayed for a job opportunity only to have God say, not yet, and then something else opened up down the road. The Apostle Paul experienced this in his life. In 2 Corinthians, he talks about this thorn in his flesh that he had. It tormented him. He pleaded with the Lord over and over again to take it away, but God's answer was not what Paul wanted. It wasn't what he expected. Instead, God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in your weakness. Now, was that an easy thing for Paul to hear in the moment? Probably not. But looking back, when he writes this letter to the Corinthians, he says, now, you know, I understand that when when I'm weak, it just gives him a chance to be all that much stronger in my life. And if it means that I have to live with this thorn, I'm going to trust him that he knows what he's doing. Rather than removing the thorn, God gave Paul the grace he needed to endure it. And he came to understand that God's strength was made perfect in his weakness, and he was able to find peace in God's answer, even though it was not the answer that he originally wanted. When you face unanswered prayers, or what feel like unanswered prayers, or when you get an answer that didn't line with where you were, the direction you were praying in, remember, God has a bigger plan. It, it, you know, we talked about this, uh, all of these prayers coming into God, Wondering, man, how does he process that? Well, he's God. That's one way he can do all that. The other thing is, you've got to remember, if God answered every prayer the way people were praying, the Cubs and Cardinals, no, no, they would never, it would always end in a tie. <laughs> and nobody wants that. We have to understand, I don't know how Cubs and Cardinals winning and losing fits into God's big scheme of things, but you know. Sometimes the Cubs losing makes me check my own attitude about things. Maybe that's the reason that the Cubs are, yeah. But we have to understand that your prayer might not have been answered in the way that you wanted it to because God's, you've got to under, you're not alone in this universe. Uh, I'm going to talk about it, the year. Why did we, why did we go through the year? Why did we lose two mothers, have a heart, why, why? God could have taken all that away. We could have not had to deal with any of that. But you know what it does? It puts me in a better place and a better perspective to show people what it looks like to suffer well. Would I have designed it differently? Oh, probably. But I'm thankful for the gift of that now that when 
I can empathize and sympathize and enter into somebody else's experience because, hey, I don't know exactly what you're going through, but I know that God, man, He brought us through this. He's got you. It's easier to say that after you've come. To, we talked about that too. It's easier to, to tell people the way out of the storm when you're in the middle of it with them. Like Paul, you might find that that God's not going to take away the thing that you want Him to take away, or maybe He's not going to give you the thing that He needs to give you, but He will give you the grace to deal with the answer that He gives you. That His grace is sufficient for you in your weakness. His power is made perfect in our dependence on Him, so we need to to surrender our desires to God's greater plan and trust that He is working all things for our good. So where does this leave us? Well, if you're feeling frustrated because God hasn't answered your prayer yet or hasn't answered in the way that you expected, take a step back. Think about some of these possible... And this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Take a step back and reflect on on these... Is there a broken relationship in your life that you need to deal with? Are your motives aligned with God's will? Are you praying at least in the direction of God's will? This is what I want, but Lord, if you've got, if there's something else, if if this is not, if my motives are bad, fix me. (laughs) Do you believe that God can really do what you're asking Him to do, or are you just praying cynically? Well, I suppose if I'm supposed to ask you for this, I should probably do it. I mean, how, off, how encouraging is that to you as a human being if somebody were to come to you with that request? Are you open to the possibility that the reason that you didn't get the answer you were expecting is because God has something else in mind? Something else, maybe even better in store for you? Prayer is not just about getting what we want. It's about aligning our hearts with God's heart. It's about growing closer to Him, trusting to Him, and surrendering our, surrendering our will to His. So as we close, I, w- I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you this week to examine your prayers. Don't just pray for what you want. Go ahead and pray for those things. God wants us to bring those desires to Him. But pray that through that process, you would come to know and understand God better. That's really the, the that, that's why we pray. It's our connection to God. Regardless of what the results are of prayer, our, the, the means that it's for us to come to know God better, to understand what He wants for our lives, His will for our lives, uh, what we need Him to do in our lives for those things to happen. Pray that you would come to know Him better. Pray to align your heart with His will and trust that no matter how He answers, He is good. He is faithful and He is working for your good and His glory. Amen? Would you pray with me?